Hello, Trojan community. Hello. Hello. Welcome to What Matters to Me and Why. I'm Jim Burklow, Senior Associate Dean of Religious Life and Spiritual Life here at USC. And uh, as many of you know, we've been doing this series for about 20 years, and it's a creative solution to the problem of, of having encounters all the time with staff and faculty here at USC and knowing what we do by way of work, but maybe not knowing that much about our personal lives, what motivates us, our, our spiritual and personal uh, sagas. So that's what this is all about. Um, rather than lecturing on their area of expertise, they talk about their lives, share their journeys with us. And if you'd like to be uh, part of this and uh, have an idea of a person that uh, you think would be great as a What Matters to Me and Why speaker, talk to us. Visit our website, orsl.usc.edu. Um, today we've got uh, Professor Andrea Hodge, Vice Provost of Undergraduate Programs, speaking with us. But before I do the introductions, uh, a couple of announcements. One is we teach a class at ORSL um, about making meaningful relationships, a class called CLICK. And that starts shortly. And if you're interested in that, talk to, to me or us, and we'll uh, set you up. Uh, on the 30th of January, we're having a dog party. So people who are, are feeling dog deprived on campus can come over to the, to the URC building in the afternoon, three in the afternoon, to pet dogs and hang out and have a good time. Tonight, we have our uh, semi-annual uh, prayer reading and burning ceremony. This is one of the most beautiful things that we do at our office We, with our interfaith council. We read aloud the prayers that are put into the prayer box in the little chapel of silence across the, the way. And we read them aloud and then ritually burn them. It's a very profound expression of the soul of our campus. That's tonight at 7 at the, o, at the URC. Uh, and our next uh, What Matters to Me and Why speaker is coming up actually very shortly on the 5th of February with Taj Frazier from Annenberg. Uh, we have plenty of sandwiches. Help yourself. And uh, sit back, relax, think of questions you might want to ask at the very end when we have our Q&A. Uh, so just stick up your hand and we'll pass the mic to you. And now I'd like to introduce Joel Bahena. PhD student in mechanical engineering, research assistant at Viterbi. Please join me in welcoming Joel to the stage. Thank you, Joel. All right. Um, I'm very honored to be introducing Dr. Hodge for the What Matters to Me and Why series. I've been one of her PhD students over the last four and a half years, making scientific discoveries in the field of nanomaterials. Beyond being a world-class scientist, her footprint at USC is extensive. She currently holds a joint appointment in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science and the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. She is also the co-director for the Core Center of Excellence in Nanoimaging, CNI, as well as the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Programs, and somehow she still manages to have enough time for her attention-seeking PhD students and her equally attention-seeking cats, Winky and Klaus. Despite holding many prestigious titles and awards throughout her career, her can-do attitude and her affinity to help others have never faltered. I first met Dr. Hodge at a graduate school panel at the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers National Conference in 2014, where through her words, she inspired me, along with several other Hispanic students, to pursue masters and PhDs in engineering that day. Her impact on underrepresented represented communities has been immeasurable on all levels. Since joining her lab, she has promoted STEM fields at neighboring elementary schools through hosting science fairs, science experiments, and introducing young students to local scientists. In addition, through her work at the provost office, she has increased the number of topping scholarships given to first-generation students. At the academic level, I have witnessed her provide opportunities to deserving Hispanic, uh, early Hispanic professors to present their work in front of field-leading scientists at prestigious conferences. Not to mention that she has one of the most diverse research groups in engineering that I have personally witnessed. At some point, in the, the woman in the lab outnumbered the men so much that Dr. Hodges' daughter felt bad for me because she believed I was one of the few men in the field of engineering. <laughs> one of the most impressive things about Dr. Hodge is that she remains humble and does not seek recognition for all her efforts and successes. Instead, she does them because someone must do it, and she is that person. 
She has quite the track record, as every position that she has taken has been left in a much better place. She is an inspiration to many and demonstrates that through hard work, determination, and passion, anything is possible. I hope her words today resonate with you like they did with me on that panel many years ago. Well, thank you, Joel. That was very sweet. I wasn't quite sure what to expect or what he was going to say. Um, I say a lot of things about around my graduate students. There's not a lot of filters, so I wasn't quite sure. Um, he has so much info. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me today and having this opportunity just to, to talk about different things and academic Lecture is always easier because it's focused on one specific thing and you can just go on and then confuse everybody and smile and then be done with that. But talking about personal things is, is a lot more difficult, if nothing else, because it requires some soul searching of what you're going to talk about. And, and so in the last couple of weeks, I've been thinking, you know, what matters to me? And so many things came through my head, you know, ranging from, you know, candy to, you know, to, to global warming. So it, it was quite a range of things to try to, okay, what should I talk about and what has matter and, and what has, you know, what would an audience at a university try to gather out of someone in my current position? And, and so it will be a little bit disjointed because that's how usually my thought process is. I wanted to have, I don't write a speech because I feel that that's, that's very too much thought out and, and this is mostly how it, it should be more fluid. And so I want to talk a little bit about you know how I got here, what milestones and challenges more in general. And so a lot of people think, oh, okay, well, she's, she's the vice provost, and, and so she made it, or she this and that. And you know, ultimately, what matters and whether you made it or not is kind of up to you. Um, so that's not necessarily a title or something that I was seeking or a position that I was seeking. I just do stuff. And so that stuff could be from cleaning the floor to setting up a new program. There's a quite range of things. So the motivation is, hasn't, it has never been for, him, for me like, I want this position. There's a specific things I wanted to do. I wanted to have a PhD when I was very young, and then I decided medical doctor is not it because, you know, I'm not a big fan of sick people because I'm always afraid it's contagious. So maybe not a good thing, and probably better for the patients and for myself. And so it took a little bit of a while, but it, it was kind of the first part of my life, and I see life in kind of like stages, was on this focus on how to get a PhD and, and getting a PhD. And so, you know, I graduated when I was 27. And since I was 12, that was basically all I thought about. And so people will say, do this. And, I'm, and I would be thinking, how does that fit with getting a PhD? And so, no, no, I can't do that, or I can't do this. Or, and, and so it, it may seem kind of weird when some, you have talking to a 15-year-old, 16-year-old that they're saying this, but that was kind of the plan. And then after that, there was not really a lot of plans. That was, that was one thing I realized, that I plan up to there, but 27 was a long time ago, <laughs> um, like three weeks ago. No, just kidding. Um, and then, you know, so how do I get here, and then what was the plan afterwards? So everything after that, it's kind of more getting to know yourself really well and, and building upon the things that make you who you are. Um, so for me, those things are, you know, the things that really mark my life. I think it was that move from South America, to, from Colombia to the United States not, as a teenager, not speaking any English. I think that's, that's a very drastic change in one's life. And, like everything in my life, or every challenge in my life, I, I met it kind of unknowingly, willingly. And, and so I was like, oh, sure, let's move to the US. That sounds good. Um, you know, when you basically, all you know about the US is whatever, I think it was like Fantasy Island and the Love Boat. So that's not really, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's just old shows from the 80s. And then they, they were dubbed in Spanish, and that's kind of like my vision of the US. Um, so you lived in an island or some kind of boat, 
uh, and so neither of those things came to be true. But that was a very harsh transition and, and kind of finding your way and has defined me you know, up to this day, as you become half and half or a little bit of this, right? So in Colombia, I'm too American. In the US, I'm too Colombian kind of thing. So you kind of neither of the two things. Um, you know, it, and so that, that puts you in a weird situation. Sometimes I, I wish, like maybe we should just stay there and then I know what I am, or maybe we should have just born here and then I know what I am, rather than kind of being all those things. And so as I have grown into my professional life and my life as an academic, I become more, I think, I'm from everywhere. And so my attitude has been, I go anywhere and it's going to be okay. So I'm from a, I'm a global citizen and I, I'm very proud to, to feel that way and to really embrace that. And I think, like, yeah, I'm okay anywhere. You know, I, I think it's all about attitude. You could have a good time anywhere or a bad time anywhere. Um, sometimes when things are really bad, I just make a good thing happen in my head and I'm like, I'm okay. Um, something's really boring or really bad, I really do just go to my head. I'm like, I'm going to change the subject, and then this is going to be OK. It's just, it really is, I think what I've learned, a lot of it is a lot of attitude, um, just the attitude that you bring into it. Um, I think as I, as I get older and I say, what would I have said to my younger self or, or to you know, this 12-year-old, this 20-year-old that all that she could think of was going to grad school, um, we, you know, just kind of take it in perspective. And it really, it was this idea of saying things out loud. And for me, once I say them out loud, I think they're going to happen. I told a lot of people since I was little that I'm going to live to be 100, because a lot of people, the women in my family have lived alone. So in my head, I have also been working towards that. Um, so I'm like, okay, I have this much time. These are sort of things I want to do. I got like 60 more years to finish this. Um, and I know it may sound crazy, but in my head, it all makes sense because I think there should be some sort of plan and something you're aiming for, but in a way to make it a fun ride along the way and to um, really make it your own path. And so at the end of it, you are you're going to be responsible to yourself for what you did or didn't do. And I don't want to have regrets. And I don't want to be a hundred and going, ah, oh, I should have done this, or I should have done that. I want to go, it was all good. I'm ready for a second round. I, I think that would be the best attitude to have when you are a hundred, or whatever age is it that, that, that you want to be at. Um, and I think that brings me to kind of touch up a little bit about the, the second really thing that changed my life, and, and it was very difficult, um, and it still changes what I do and how I think and how I move forward, and that was the death of, of my late husband. So he died at 35 of a heart attack. Um, it was a sudden heart attack uh, from a generic, generic, um, genetic disease that we didn't know about, and I think that perhaps was and has been the most significant event in my life that really just kind of brought everything kind of like to the name of this cafe, to ground zero. It was very, 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 very much back to the basics, like breathe. How can it be more basic than that? It was really, I had a lot of people around me just go, breathe. And then I remember to breathe. I mean, it was down to that. and so. Although I have gone through my life with this, you can do this, and you can do anything, and you know, I'm going to be 100, it was really kind of like having that happen and stop and think, what am I doing? What are we all doing? Where does this, this all stop? That, that became kind of this kind of philosophical conversation that I have with myself all the time. I think. Even though I was already in my 30s, in my late 30s, it was, it was the first time I really appreciated the, my personality at that point. I, I don't really have a problem with who I am or how I do things. I never had that. So that doesn't really is part of who I am. But I never really appreciated it until then. And so 
when things got so difficult to the point, like I said, we're down to the basics, I always thought, I, I, I desperately needed who I always have been. And so I appreciated the fact that I had always been outgoing or that I always thought that I could figure it out or that I always tried to look at, I always, always think the glass is half full or about to spill. I don't ever see empty. And so I, I read a lot. I read a lot of books on grief, a lot of books on growth and self-evaluation. I read a lot about widows all over the world and how they're mistreated um, in different parts of the world. And in some parts, they even count basically as property from the late husband. So just all these things that I never thought of. And, and, and I remember being just sadder be, beyond anything I could think, because I have never felt that kind of sadness in my life. I come from a big family. I have 52 first cousins. It's a big Colombian family. And I really never had people pass away unless they were like 100. So it was never this somebody suddenly gone, you know, kind of taken rapidly from your life. And so I, I really didn't have that experience before. And so having really to think that and, and what it means in life and how rapidly it could go, I could think of many things. And I, I was thankful that I was not one of those widows going through the world, being treated as property or losing all my rights because my husband had passed away. But I, I, in my head, I could also see all of them. And I could think of all the people, of all the women in the world that you know, didn't have the education and opportunities and the stability and all the support that I had. And every night that I would go to bed, I always think of them and, and send them my love. I, I always think you could do that. I know that we don't speak the same language. I, don't, I know that we're not in the same continents. I know that we never probably will meet. But I do really think you can send that energy through the world. I, I really do think so. Like, I know I never met you, but I'm sending you my love because this is hard, and, I, and you have it way harder than me. Um, I think that was a big growing lesson. And it was also a growing lesson because it really makes you question why you're doing what you're doing and whether it matters or not. And so I'm very, I always been unwilling to do what people tell me, which has always gotten me in trouble. But then more so now than before. Because why do it if I don't like it? Why do it if I don't want to? Why do it if I hate it? Like, and that doesn't mean you give up on everything that is hard. That's not it, because I mean, a PhD is hard. Don't quit. You're about to finish. That's not what I'm saying. But how can you go through life going through the motions just because you're going through the motions and you're not connected to it in a deeper level, in a level that inspires you and motivates you to do better. And so at some point, you know, we're in this fortunate position that we can make our choices. We're not somebody's property. We're not in, you know, we're not in jail. We're not in a situation in which we cannot control our own lives. So we do control it. It may not be an immediate change, but it's something you can plan for and say, I'm gonna be accountable to myself and at the end of the day, when, when that day to say goodbye to this earth comes, I want to be accountable, but I want to be, I want to be smiling about it. I don't want to be regretting it. I want to be full on just going, you know, that really was a good run. I have so many plans for the future, and, and they're, they're not logical or any specific step, and, and it shouldn't be, and you shouldn't expect it. It's great if somebody has that, but that doesn't mean you had to have it. You know, I want to do different things. You know, just I want to be, you know, in the carnival in Rio de Janeiro, and that's the whole day. You know, as much as I want to be in the Academy of you know, National Science and Engineering, I I do want both things, and I come, you know, 60 more years. I think I can do it. You know, it's just a matter of when am I going to get to do all this. Um, but I want a life well lived. I think a lot of pe the people that know me will know that I don't drink alcohol. And that's a personal choice that I made a long time ago because I wanted to, 
I just, whatever I did, I wanted to be fully awake for it or fully aware of. I have very little inhibitions, so I don't need something to help me lose my inhibitions. So, you know, I, I, I heard some people say, well, I needed to relax. I'm like, eh, no. <laughs> I also have people ask me when I'm doing something, do you drink something? <laughs> like, no. Why are you dancing? It's a good song. And you know, so I, I had all these things happen, and, but I, I really wanted to be fully awake. I think we do enough weird and crazy things, being fully aware of what we do, so I don't need that. And, and that's a personal choice, and I'm not judging anybody. It's just I really want to have every 365 days, uh, for whatever 100 years, that I live the, the day fully, that I remember it fully, or that I was present to it, whether it was really sad, and because that makes you grow, that makes, I think that's the most human I ever felt to something that is very happy. I, I think in order for us to experience that, we need to be fully there and fully present. Um, and I think that that is very, very important to understand, to be present in our lives and to really think about, you know, whether this wall is gray or blue, does it really, in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter that much? But what does matter to you that leaves a lasting, long impression and an imprint of who you are and to the people that come after you and for the people that you relate with? How is that footprint? Are people better because they know you? Or are you a forgettable experience? So I'd much rather incur some kind of motiva emotion, whether it's hate or love, than, than, than just neutral. I guess, I guess I don't know neutral either. And, and for me, that would be hard as well. You know, again, somebody with, so it's sounding pretty crazy, right? Like no inhibitions, no neutral. That, that is has, how it has always been. But it, at the same time, in the hardest part of my life, that's what, I believe save me. People can go through a hardship and you know become you know lose themselves, become an addict or something. Or people can go through something really traumatic and then really come out of it and start a foundation and help others. It's a very interesting to even think about that. People that the same thing happened to, the very different reactions and the di different paths that people can take. So which one are you? When something bad happens, which one are you going to be? I mean, self-pity is easy. And you can stay there for a very long time. Because of course something bad happened, and it hurts. But it's life, and it's short, and so you should do something about it. And I remember thinking there, and, and I, had, I did work with a therapist um, from USC, actually. And she helped me a lot. And, and I was like, I want to be able to go back to being alive. Because right now, I'm just breathing. And she's like, you know, that is actually normal for some people. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. I want to, I want to live. I, I understand I'm going to be sad, but I want to live. I want to. I want to live for myself and for my late husband because he didn't get a chance to do, f to do that. I want to make sure that I have, that I enjoy and that I do things that are enjoyable and things that are meaningful. And so that's why I'm willing to take on challenges. Sometimes they pay out, sometimes they don't, but at least I would not say I didn't try. Um, there's very few things I don't try, like big roller coasters or, you know, Going really fast in a car, you know, just that doesn't appeal to me. But, you know, they go, oh, can you go around this? Sure. Can you take care of this? Sure. Do you want to speak in front of 100 people or two? Sure. You know, I, this is very rarely that I would say, why not? I think it's a privilege. I mean, if, uh, even being here today, I know it's a small group, but being able to reach in a different way, or, or even the fact that you're willing to listen to whatever nonsensical stuff I'm saying, it, it, is, it is meaningful. And I'm glad I'm here to say it, because I have things. I think I have, I have lived a well-lived life, and a full life. 
And I'm looking forward for the next 60 years to continue to do so. Because when you do so, you give permission to other people to live a well, a good life, to live a full life. And by good life and full life, I don't mean like this much money or this title or this prestige. It's just, you know, like a life you enjoy. And whether that enjoyment is something really fancy or something really simple, it doesn't matter. The thing is that, that you enjoy it, that you take a moment to pause and say, wow, it's a beautiful sunny day. It's good. Just, just to have that acknowledgement, rather than go, I have to do this, I have to give the speech, I have to do this, I have to talk to Sid, da, 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 da. I have to do interviews, I have to eat lunch, I have to go buy something, I have to go whatever. Just acknowledge that is good. And it's OK. You're not bragging. You're just being thankful for what we've been given and for what we have. And that builds up to help you deal with difficult things, because difficult things happen to everyone. There are different levels. And I hope you never had to experience what I experienced. But it was my own, I think, positive attitude that really got me through it. Because I, I remember, again, talking to the therapist. She saying, I, I told her, in my regular life, in my regular life, if you go from one being like depressed to 10 being like jumping around because you're so happy, I'm usually at about an A. And right now I'm like a three, and I, I don't like how that feels. Can we take me, and, and I will say to her, can I go back to at least five? And I always, as a scientist, I like to quantify things. So I'm like, just a five. I can't handle this three. I can't breathe at three. It's too sad. And she's like, you know, just let the grieving process happen. And, and then try to look at the good things on it. So I thought, you know, I had a, wonderful husband who loved me, who was, by the way, also very good looking, spoke several languages, and was a really good cook, and loved me, every piece of me. And so I was thankful, and I should be thankful for that, because a lot of people also don't get to experience that. I know it was short, but I got to experience it. And I get to experience love every day with my family. But you have to be open to heal and help that bring you to the next level so you can understand and appreciate the life that you are living. It's not good that 20 years from now you, go, you want to go and say, oh, that was good. Appreciate it now. Go back and, and to someone that makes your life better, Althea, say, you know, you're awesome. You make my life better every day. Why wait 20 years? Do it now. What about a student? A student that may be drive you a little nuts, but you know, it's a really good student. And you say, you know, you inspire me to keep going. And all the enthusiasm and all the youth and all that, that inspires me. Try to look at it in the good side. And I'm not talking about being Pollyanna. And just I'm talking is like, it's life and you have one. So it has to count. Or at least I think he should. And you have to enjoy it. And it doesn't matter if it's a small enjoyment. It could be, sometimes I'm just happy eating candy. That's fine. It's just, that is completely allowable. We have these expectations that it has to be something really grandiose. But it's all those little moments, all those snapshots or happiness that keep you going when you need it. And so I try to save all these spots of you know, this is a beautiful sunset. This is a beautiful ocean. This is a beautiful conversation. This is a succulent meal. Like, all that all together so it can give you, infuse you with energy when you need it. And I think that has been very important. One, to understand that we all have the power within ourselves to be the best person of ourselves, the best version of ourselves that we can be, and also that we control our destiny. We're in that privileged position that we control it. You do make the decisions, and that doesn't mean you go do something crazy, but ultimately, you do decide. Maybe it's not six weeks from now, maybe it's six months from now, maybe six years from now, but what is your plan? Are you gonna be stuck? Are you gonna change it? Are you gonna enjoy it? Are you enjoying your day to day? I ask that to myself, 
all the time. I think it's important. I think if Oliver would have had a chance, you know, he would be asking himself that same question because he wanted his life to be meaningful. I think as I pass to my daughter, a, a life would live, I always tell her that it's very important that she enjoys it and that she's grateful. I continually tell her, continuously tell her, be grateful for the good things and share them because you need those things to help you go when things get rough, when things are hard. I think, you know, I, about talk just enough, I think I really just am trying to live an excellent life, but not an excellent life to somebody else's standards, but to mine, because that's who ultimately I'm accountable for. We know what is, like, what, is, what is the commonalities to being a good person or a bad person. That, I think mean, at this level and this stage in this university, we know that. We don't have to go through those basics. But what is an excellent life for you? I love being a professor. I love, 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 love being an engineer. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. I don't have to wonder about that. I love the fact that I get to experiment with science, that I have a lab, that we see things that we've never seen before, that create knowledge, that we get to explore, study, and understand phenomena in science that no one ever studied before. How cool is that? That I get to do that arguing with my students back and forth, whether that's a real scientific argument or not. The fact that I have seven PhD students that keep my life very interesting it's a privilege, and I do love that, and I love what I do. And I, like I said, I, being an engineer, if I had to pick again, that's exactly what I would pick. It fits me so well. It suits my personality so well. It's like sometimes I feel like it was made for me. And I hope for some of you, what you do also feels like that. Like someone came and made this profession just for you. Because it's a good feeling, and it keeps you going, and it keeps you grounded, and it keeps you, you know, mostly pretty happy. Perhaps not at an eight or a nine like I used to be, but you know, a seven. So I got past the five I wanted to be. And most days, I'm mostly at a seven. Sometimes, if good meals are provided and there's lots of sweets, I could go to an eight. <laughs> but that's easy to fix. And so with that, you know, I'll just leave you with whatever those words of wisdom that I have, which is to live an excellent life and to live it to the fullest because it's yours. And it's time, time makes life. And time is precious and your life is precious. And you have to give it that value that is precious. So thank you so much for listening to me. Questions for Andrea? Pass the uh, mic. You got it? Anybody? Anybody It's a shy crowd. Oh, there you go. Brian. Hi, Andrea. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that um, you are a global citizen. Do you think you could expand upon that and why you feel um, how you feel your life has got you to be like that? Well, I, I think that I, when I go, because of my job and, and that I go everywhere, um, and I, I mean, fortunate enough to travel pretty much all over the world, you know, I can say, like, I, I look at the similarities, and there's a lot of similarities, maybe a different language. But you know, you go through an airport in Singapore or Hong Kong or in Germany or whatever, and there you are. There's the mom, the dad, the kid, they're holding, they're going, come on, come on, come on. It's the same. People are in line to eat, it's the same. People are looking at their watch, it's the same. So we are more the same than we're not. And so I think the world, especially now with all the technology and all the connectivity, the world is basically the same, maybe in a different language and maybe with a slightly different spices. 
what is the same? And so that's why I feel, you know, I go somewhere. I, I remember I was in Croatia, um, I think it was last year, maybe the year before. And I was like, I can live here. And then I went to Spain, I'm like, I can live here. It, so, so it's kind of this feeling like, I can be anywhere. You know, it's like good people, there's good people everywhere. There's some good food everywhere. There's maybe not bad weather. Maybe I can't do like Alaska or something. But, you know, something like that. It, it's, we're so similar. We're so very similar. And, and so I look at these things like color of the skin or this and that, and like, psh, it's all the same. So that's why I feel it, it, it doesn't, we're all the same. At the end, I think I haven't met a person that says they don't want a human connection, they don't want to be with a family, they don't want to be loved, or they don't, I never met that person. Everybody wants a connection, they want to be, they want to be a host, they want to, for you to feel great, they want you to love their country, they want you to see what the beautiful things in their country are, what, beautiful things in their family, you know, it's all the same. And so that's why I feel like there's no, I don't see that as a boundary anymore. I think with this age and with all the connectivity, we, you know, this global citizen, that's, that's kind of what we're aiming for. That doesn't mean you lose your identity, but that you should be more open to everybody else and for the rest of the world and don't think of, you know, it's, it's, it's not an alien. You know, it's, it's nothing that difficult. It's somebody pretty much just like you, just with a different accent or maybe a different a different language. Um, you know, like everybody has some kind of something that looks like an empanada. Everybody, they call it different things. But almost any country in the world has something that looks like an empanada. They don't call it an empanada, but it's exactly the same. Some kind of pastry with stuff inside. And then, you know, you have it all the time, and you can have different stuff inside. Fish, cheese, meat, potatoes. It's just, I mean, I mean it's a simple, uh, over a simple explanation, but that's kind of how I see it. Like, we're all the same. Maybe they call it pierogi here, and maybe they call it wonton here, but it's like all the same thing. It's an empanada with a different name. Jesus had to ask if it's spicy or not, otherwise it's the same. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just wondering if you could tell us what inspired a little Colombian girl to want to go and get a PhD, and when and how did you come to engineering? Ooh, that's an interesting path. Um, so just like almost anything in my life, um, it came through reading something. and. Um, my family is low income. I come from a low income family from South America. Um, and that just seemed like being a doctor was such a high status thing and such a life changing thing and such a respectable profession. Again, independent of what doctor that was, that I knew I was smart. And I, I remember somebody saying, like, that's all you need forgetting all the ingredients, right? Like, oh yeah, make this recipe. All you need is an egg when missing 40 other ingredients. But you know, when you are 12, like, oh, okay, that sounds easy. Smart, check, okay, I'm gonna do it. Um, first, I wanted, initially I wanted to be a writer. That's what I wanted to do. Um, I was inspired by Neruda and, and I really, I thought that's what I wanted to be. Then, then I wanted to be an opera singer. Then I wanted to be a nun. Then I wanted to be president of Colombia. So there's a lot of things in there because I'm interested in so many things. Uh, but I still wanted, then I thought all those things could happen if, if I, I had this doctorate, people would take me more seriously, which people do even when they shouldn't. Because sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> And so engineering just came by moving to the US and the fact that I didn't speak <coughs> English. Then language became a little bit, well, no, not a little bit. It was a huge problem. And so, uh, but numbers didn't change. So, so all of a sudden, I was the really smart girl in math. 
but just because I couldn't speak English. So then that became the comfort zone. And, I, and then and the more I did it, the more I liked it. And so when I had to pick something to do, um, it was by a process of elimination. So I didn't like anything else. So all that was left was engineering. So it was between picking between civil engineering, electrical engineering, <laughs> mechanical engineering. Those were my choices. So I picked the broadest, which was mechanical engineering. And I think, like I said, it's, it's been pretty much a perfect fit. Um, Yes. Sorry. I just have a question. Um, like, I just want to know if you could say more about the process of elimination, because I'm also an individual who's been interested in a million different things, and just in terms of figuring out what to study in the first place has been a real challenge for me. So I'm just wondering how you went about that process of elimination. So, well, so again, some of those things took care of themselves, such as, you know, the language barrier, obviously. Um, it will always be a barrier. I, I always have an accent and pronounce things incorrectly, or, you know, my Bs are always Bs, whatever it is, and people don't know if I'm saying Vegas or Vegas. So, um, so that kind of eliminated itself. And then I thought, la, hmm, no. You know, kind of what sparked my interest. And so, I was philosophy, no, social, no. So I was going through those things, and then I was reading about engineering, and part of it is part, like, I didn't really understand the whole thing. Maybe that, like, the mysterious part of it made it interesting, because <laughs> other things were easier to understand. It's like, he has math, um, it's challenging, it's creative, but not like you have to draw or paint, because I'm not very good at that. So, okay, so you, it's creative. Um, it has all sorts of um, implications on cars, transportation, housing. So I'm like, it has a footprint everywhere. So one of those things will definitely be something I can go into. And so it was really kind of looking at all the main majors and going through like, that doesn't really come to me. And then engineering called to me, and then he was just picking on um, which of the ones I wanted to do. But he was more really looking at all of them and saying, I don't see myself doing that. Um, I, you know, like I said, a medical doctor. I said, well, I don't, I'm afraid of needles. I'm afraid of blood. OK, you know, let's just take that out. You know, so just kind of being very, um, like very uh, obvious with yourself or the thing you you should know the things you like and you don't like at this point and then that's kind of like a little bit trusting your gut rather than saying oh somebody wants me to be this well i know i don't like it so i mean i could try to do what they want me to do but why well maybe that's not a good <laughs> advice but i don't want to do that i remember when I was about 15, and I thought I could be like the head man, and yes, yes, I know, and and that, uh, and so I was talking to actually Mother Superior. She was she came from from Rome, and um, they had picked some students from all over the country to speak to Mother Superior, and I was like, oh yes, I'm going to be Mother Superior, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to have a PhD and this and that, and and so my. My regular teacher was there. She was Sorro Salva. She was another nun. And then she turned around to me, and in the sweetest manner, she, she was my first grade teacher, my second grade teacher, and a long life friend. And she said to me, Andreita, I think for you to be a nun, we had to make you again and change your personality. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I thought there was a shortage of nuns, and you just <laughs> told me not to do that. OK. So, but, Mentorship, right? <laughs> and then she said that, and I was a little upset. I'm like, what do you mean? You're talking all the time that there's no nuns, da 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 da. Like, you know, they're going out of business because there isn't any. Here I am telling you I'll be mother superior. You just told me that I need a different personality, you know? It's important, those mentorships and kind of learning that about yourself and having those moments of truth say, you know, 
I, I cannot see myself in a cold room. You know, some people that would be like, oh, exciting, that would be adrenaline. I would fall asleep. You know, so you need to know that about yourself. I can't even watch a show about it on TV, <laughs> let alone be there. So you do know more than you think. The thing is about giving yourself the power to make those choices and trusting your gut. That is the scary part. Others? <laughs> Somebody else? Anybody else? Ah, Tristan. <laughs> Um, that led me, what well, you led into this question I wanted to ask you is what motivates you to mentor others? Well, I think mentorship is, is something I have received openly and has done so much good in my life. I had some wonderful mentors throughout my life. Again, we can start with Sol Rosalba, my first grade teacher, to, you know, to my PhD advisors and, and the current mentors that I, that I have now. And it's just kind of those people, you need them because they tell you what you need to hear sometimes that you don't want to hear it. When you're questioning yourself about, oh, should I, but that looks better, that would look better, but I'm like, but you hate it. You know? And so I think it's important to have that voice um, it's not motivation because it is your life ultimately. So I'm not trying. So so I'm not trying to shape you into who I am or what I would want to be. I want you to be the first version of yourself. And so sometimes with that is, you know, if one of my students, for example, my graduate students who I spend the most time with, they come and they come with some idea that I think you know. Like this is inconsistent with every, I have listened to you for four years, five years, three years, more than that, and this is inconsistent with everything you've done. So I am gonna question you on it, and I'm gonna be hard of you on it, because right now you're having a struggle, and so I need to be that voice of reasoning there, because I know you so well. And so that's just one of the important things about being a mentor. You do have to develop that relationship deep enough that you understand and you can be consistent to what values are for that person or not. And then, you know, it's hard when you go back and you tell them, is this consistent with everything you wanted or you said you were going to do? And a lot of times the answer is, uh, no. But someone has to say it. And, and so that's why it's important. And I think as we have the students that are 20, 21, 22, 23, et cetera, et cetera, it's a it's a time of questioning and struggling and, and, and so it is important to ask them those questions of reflection um, with compassion and love. And that's what a mentor does and so that's why I think it's so important to mentor. Thank you for mentoring us today. All right. Thank you very much. There you go. It's very nice. <laughs> yeah. To uh, write down what matters to her and why for posterity. I actually burn it down so I don't want anybody to know. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs>